a very good evening to all school of english kumaragulu college of liberal arts and science welcomes you all to the third day of international talk series celebrating part of avan we take immense pleasure in celebrating the great legend in english literature william shakespeare today being world book day i quote a line from shakespeare's the tempest knowing i loved my books he furnished my on library with volumes that i prize above my duke top so i'm uncoating it without much delay i now welcome the speaker for the session professor ross king uh, she will be taking us through the topic why bother now with T uh, shakespeare to give a brief introduction of uh, professor king she is a professor emeritus at the university of southampton and recently was the visiting plumer fellow at saint anne's university of oxford she had served on the academic committee of shakespeare's globe london and on the boards of directors of the english shakespeare company and nuffield southampton theatres Professor King has uh, run a professional theatre company and directed many early modern plays of Middleton, Webster, Shakespeare, with both students and professional actors. Uh, she is also a musician. She sings and plays cello, piano, and lute. That is very interesting of her. And the writings of Professor King uh, combines standard archival. Uh, academic research in the history and culture of early modern england with practical skills in performance her research interests are primarily in drama and in the renaissance in particular in shakespeare and pre shakespearean drama uh, her books includes the world of richard edwards politics poetry and performance in modern early modern drama uh, england symbol in constructions of britain and shakespeare a beginner's guide have been variously reviewed as of interest to any humanities researcher surprising but suggestive and ebulliently pluralistic she has a long standing interest in applied theater both in education and in therapeutic settings at southampton she has contributed to the medical humanities which is a different area more and she has prepared a module for the medical students by using the winter tale the play of shakespeare to inspire the students creative thinking about mental health body body language and doctor patient interactions uh, professor king recently completed a beginner's guide to shakespeare and she's preparing a book of essays on silence sound and gestures in shakespeare and beginning a project on cognition and emotions in early modern drama i am sure none other than professor ross king can tell us why bother now with shakespeare over to you ma'am Thank you. Thank you very much for that very kind um, introduction, and w welcome to you all. Um, the, the news from India this morning on on the ra radio in uh, in the UK was very alarming, and I'm deeply deeply sorry for the situation you find yourselves in. Um, I suppose there is light at the end of the tunnel. We've, we're beginning to come through it, but I'm I, you know, I am con I'm concerned for you. So. Thank you for being here and for worrying about Shakespeare. Um, I'm going to give you a spoiler. Um, I do think we should bother. So <laughs> uh, it's not going to be a suspense. I do think we should bother with Shakespeare. So my talk is about why we should be doing that. So if I now just start uh, sharing my screen, um, uh, I hope you can see that. So um, there he is. Happy birthday to Shakespeare. Well, if it is his birthday, who knows? Um, it's a conjecture, as was his de death date, also on St. George's Day. Um, we don't really know. Uh, dates of birth weren't given in those days. We just know when his birth was registered and when his death was registered. And people have liked to think it was St. George's Day because they have liked to think of him as England's national poet. Um, 
but I want to start um, as as Paul Yakin did uh, uh, two days ago. He started with some keywords. So my first keyword for today is the liberal arts. Now this is a keyword which you ought to be very familiar with. Those of you who are at the college, who's organised kindly organised this series, um, because uh, it's in your title. Uh, but I think it just, it's worth just remembering what the liberal arts were in Shakespeare's time. And they were divided into the trivium, which can, included grammar, Latin grammar, of course, uh, logic and rhetoric. And that's what he would have learnt if, as we presume he did, he went to uh, Stratford-on-Avon's uh, grammar school, the King Edward VI grammar school there. Um, if he had gone on to university, which we don't think he did, um, if, but if he had, a lot of his um, uh, education would have been in rhetoric and logic, but he would then perhaps have gone on to the quadrivium, which includes the sciences um, of geometry, music, interesting to think of as music as a science, astronomy, and also arithmetic. So the liberal arts isn't just a, a term for you know, being arty. It's about the education that you need to have to be free. And I think that, that freedom and education is something which is underpinning everything I want to say today about Shakespeare. Um, so I want to take you on a journey of imagination. I want to take you on a time travel, not just 400 years back to Shakespeare's time, but 40,000 years back to this uh, bone flute, which was found in a cave. So somebody 40,000 years ago picked up the bone of a griffin vulture and started to carve it into a flute. Now we don't know whether it was he or somebody else who then transported that flute into one of the most cavernous parts of the local cave system, the most resonant part, and started to play it. We have no idea whether it was a man or a woman, and we have no idea what they played. In a nearby cave, this was found. It's a man dressed up as a lion, we presume it's that way round and not a lion pretending to be a man. But anyway, it's a combination of man and lion. I find both of these objects immensely moving. That 40,000 years ago, people were making music and they were imagining themselves as animals. Now, we don't know for what purpose and we don't know how they did it but clearly they were performing something. F performance is absolutely endemic to human beings. It's what we do, and we do it all the time, whether we think we do it or not. And we make music all the time. We speak and we use our voices to make intonation, even if we don't think we can sing. But of course we can all sing. We can all make music if only it's just clapping our hands. And I think we need to think about how this basic human ability to make sound and to imagine yourself as something else, and we do that probably every night when we dream, or to imagine ourselves into different situations, how that is absolutely intrinsic to what we are as a species. So there we go, 40,000 years old, both of them. Isn't that amazing? And this is the griffin vulture. Um, 20 years ago, they were in danger of extinction, but a rewilding project in Bulgaria has brought them back from the brink. Now, it's, it might be, seem strange to show you a picture of some birds in a, in a Shakespeare talk, but again, you know, these are birds which are directly related to their ancestors who made that flute 40,000 years ago, who made the raw material for that flute 40,000 years ago. Um, we presume they haven't changed very much. I don't think we can have changed very much in 40,000 years. There's not enough evolutionary time. We may be very different in the way in which we speak 
and the way in which we conduct our societies and the way in which we, we make art and uh, dress and everything else which we do culturally. But somewhere deep down, there's something which relates to us um, in that person who made that flute and made that, that wooden creature of the lion and the man all that time ago. So watching a play in 1605, this is John Davis. He was actually a writing tutor to the nobility. So he's educated, but he's definitely not a noble person. And he's in a theater, a theater which um, was very probably the globe or something like it, something which has hierarchical structures of audiences. So uh, the, you've got the groundlings at the bottom, you've got the middling people in the middle rooms, and then you've got the, the more important noble people um, at the top. But this, this poem seems to me to be a really sophisticated analysis of what happens to us when we look at a play. And it seems to be more sophisticated um, and more accurate than some of the more famous descriptions um, about the suspension of disbelief, which you may have come across um, Coleridge's uh, description of what you do when you, when you watch a play. So I'll read it to you. Like a looker on a tragedy, within the middle room, among the mean, he means amongst the middling sort of people, the, the mean in the middle, the average people, I see the fall of state and majesty, while amongst the press to a pillar sure I lean. So he's amongst the crowd, the press, and he's leaning against the pillar, which is holding up the, 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 the rooms, the building above him. I think that consciousness of himself in a building, the, the fact that he can feel it on his shoulder is really important. He's very aware of himself, as a human being in a particular situation now in a theater with other human beings. And he's aware that he's watching other human beings performing in a play. That's a very strange thing to be doing. I think we must be the only um, animal that does that, watches us, um, other people like ourselves pretend to be yet other people. So I see the fall of state and majesty while amongst the press to a pillar sure I lean. So see I others' sorrows with delight, though others' sorrows do but make me sad. But plagues to see which on ourselves might light, free from their fall, makes nature grieving glad. Now that combination of contradictions, that you can grieve and be glad at the same time, um, that you can uh, see other people suffering from the plague and be glad it's not you, as I think we can all relate to that at the moment, can we not? Um, and yet it might be coming very, very close to you uh, in real life. What he likes about going to the theatre is that it's not his family that's suffering. Um, it's not even his class that's suffering. It's he's seeing the suffering of the great. Um, and that gives him pause for thought and it gives him emotional fulfillment. So I think this analysis of the um, very conflicted emotions which run through you when you watch a play, particularly when you watch a tragedy, um, uh, I think it's a very profound and accurate analysis of what happens to us. So, the truest poetry is the most feigning. Now, that's Shakespeare's wise clown in the comedy As You Like It. Now, the comedy As You Like It actually starts as a tragedy for some people. The Duke has been banished, his daughter has been um, retained at court, Rosalind, I'm, I'm named after Rosalind, the heroine of uh, As You Like It. Um, it starts in a very dark place, but it ends with marriage and with comedy and fulfillment. But in this line, the truest poetry is the most feigning. We have another paradox that when you write a poem, watch a poem, watch a play. You're watching a piece of fiction. 
It's not true. And yet it is true. It is the most profound truth. Now, Shakespeare, although he didn't write his own kind of theory of drama, puts a lot of theory of drama into every play that he writes. He's thinking very, very carefully about the structure of every play. Every play has a slightly different structure. He's experimenting the whole time. And he's clearly very, very well aware that in his day, as has happened throughout recorded history, people have had a very problematic view of the theatre. They don't trust it. They think actors are vagabonds, layabouts. Uh, they think that the, the untruthfulness of a play is somehow not valuable. And there have been attempts throughout history to cajole the theatre, to confine the theatre into what is suitable for any particular society. Now, Shakespeare's very well aware of that, and he's writing his plays, I think, in the knowledge that somebody somewhere might want to change them or to censor them. Now, what is remarkable about the way he writes is that that, has, that project has not succeeded, not yet. Uh, there have been numerous attempts to rewrite Shakespeare ever since he first started writing. But what is remarkable about his plays, as we saw yesterday in the lecture, is that they are translatable into other times and places. And those translations, if they're good art, will themselves also last. Because, of course, Shakespeare never borrowed um, a plot. He often borrowed a story. So his stories are often culled from other, other people's writing. But the, the, uh, the play that he made of those borrowed stories is always intrinsically his own. And I suspect he never read Aristotle either. Um, but Aristotle is saying something like the same thing. The wonderful is pleasing. A probable impossibility is to be preferred to an improbable possibility. Now that's a paradox too. I think it's the most important thing that Aristotle says about poetry and the writing of drama, but nobody ever quotes it. They will talk about the three unities, which actually Aristotle doesn't mention. He only mentions a unity of um, plot and action. Um, he doesn't mention unity of time and place. Um, and this is one of the things that Sir Philip Sidney, one of uh, Shakespeare's slightly earlier contemporaries, thought was really rather immoral about plays and, and rather stupid about theatre, that, that, that the theatre could change its location in a, the blink of an eye into, um, you know, it could be in Egypt one moment and Rome the next, as indeed it is in Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. How can that possibly be? Well, it's an impossibility. But in the course of watching Antony and Cleopatra, it is entirely probable. And it's the making probable that is the art of the dramatist. A probable impossibility is to be preferred to an improbable possibility. Right, so our other keywords for today are democracy, possibly, or social contract, possibly. Uh, democracy, well, democracy has its problems, doesn't it? Uh, uh, Winston Churchill thought it was the, um, the least worst option, but we've had some terrifying periods, I think, in recent history, where demagogues have uh, risen to power democratically. And of course, Hitler, the Nazi, was democratically voted in to German government in the 1930s. So democracy has its problems. Social contract, well, I think social contract is a very interesting idea. And it's clear from the drama of the 16th century that it was exercising people 
um, at that stage. The the book that was uh, mentioned at the beginning uh, Rich, by Richard Edwards, um, the, the book about Richard Edwards and his, his poems and plays. Richard Edwards was a, a court musician and also dramatist. Um, he was clearly concerned about the social contract between people and the king, because he writes a play called Damon and Pythias, which is about a tyrant, a very famous tyrant. In fact, the, the tyrant Dionysius um, was a, a pro proverbial tyrant in the 16th century. He, he was the person that you would uh, hang, hold up as an example of how not to run a country. So there is a, a great tradition um, in English politics about wondering about how to control your monarch. And of course, only something like 30 years after Shakespeare died, we were busy um, having a civil war in this country. Um, and in 19, uh, 1642, um, that broke out in earnest. And in 1649, we beheaded the king. That's an unbelievable thing to do at that, at that period. Um, it, didn't last, we reinstated our king, but we had various attempts over the following two, three hundred years to um, it, to get a real social contract in place. I don't think we've managed it yet because we've got severe uh, discrepancy between rich and poor in this country. The, the, the gap between the rich and the poor in this country, as across the world, is growing every day. And that's not a social contract in my view. The person who termed this term, uh, who, who coined the term, though, social contract, was, of course, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, famous for the line, man is born free, but is everywhere in chains. Um, he talks about the state of nature. So that is the link with my griffin vultures in the Rodopi Mountains. There they are in a rewilded um, uh, Rodopi Mountains, which has enabled them to come make this comeback from the br uh, brink of extinction. He also, uh, Rousseau, wrote his first discourse on the relationship between the science and the arts and the, the importance of both. Uh, and he wrote an entire book on the social contract. So this is uh, the, these discussions about where we go, how we make a democracy, um, are un also underpinning uh, my talk today. Because, I, did, I bet you weren't expecting to see this. <laughs> Um, getting ready for a performance. I think it's probably um, a Shakespeare comedy. Uh, Shakespeare was actually adopted by the Germans from the 19th century onwards. Um, they thought he was a rather better German than he was an English person. Um, and certainly the, uh, the Nazis felt that they could not ignore great art and needed to be shown, uh, need, needed to be able to demonstrate that they were um, supporting the arts. So you can see uh, my note here on, on the left hand side of the screen that um, Shakespeare was adopted as a Germanic author. Um, but they weren't too keen of the history plays, a play such as Richard II, which I'll come back to later, in which a king is deposed by the people. Um, not a good look for the uh, Nazi government. Um, but they wanted to be seen to be supporting the arts and therefore increased their subsidy of German um, theatre by a whopping 500%. But as I say, it was mostly the comedies, particularly actually um, The Taming of the Shrew, we now think, that was particularly popular, perhaps because it kept, it was a play they thought about um, keeping women in their place, um, uh, being able to run the home and produce more um, um, fodder for the German army. I don't think that's what The Taming of the Shrew is, but when you are able to translate a play into a different language, you can then adapt it both subtly and not so subtly, and you can present a play under a title where the meaning of the play has been changed quite a lot. So one of the things I want to urge you to think about um, in all of your dealings with Shakespeare, is not so much what the story is, because as I said earlier, the story is almost always borrowed from another writer, but how 
precisely that story is being presented in language. And I know you're going to say to me, oh, but the language is too difficult. But I'm hoping that I can persuade you in the, what is it, the next um, half an hour, that it's not as difficult as you think it might be, particularly if you start reading it aloud to yourself. So my tip for today is find out the storyline first, because actually many of the people going to see a play originally, Shakespeare play originally, would have known the storyline. And then to do take some time to read it out loud, think about how it feels in your mouth when you read it, and think about the precise choice of word. If he chooses odd words, why does he choose those words? So, since um, the Nazis didn't like the history plays, let's start with a history play. And Jan Kott, who was a Polish uh, critic and therefore had experienced the, the Nazi terror in Poland in the Second World War and was still living under a dictatorship it, when he wrote in uh, 1965, Shakespeare, our contemporary. So for the last, what is it, 50 years or so, um, we've been worrying as to whether Shakespeare is our contemporary, whether we can still read Shakespeare now. And this is what he says about the scene in Richard III when Hastings is woken up at four in the morning and told that he must come to the court, it's urgent. It is 4 a.m. For the first time in tragedy, Shakespeare gives the exact time. It is significant that this should be 4 a.m. It is the hour between night and dawn, the hour when decisions in high places have been taken, when what had to be done has been done. But it is also the hour when one can still save oneself by leaving one's home, the last hour in which freedom of choice is still possible. So if we're thinking about this history play and the role of the people in history, you know, it's about Rich III, it's about his um, rise to power, it's about his murderousness, it's about his scheming. Yes, but he can't do all that scheming without the people. He's desperate to get the voice of the people. And just in the middle of the play, we have two very sh small scenes, one with three citizens who are worrying and scared about what's going to happen to them. They're anxious about the future. They're anxious because there's a child on the throne and children aren't, aren't powerful enough. And then there's another scene with a scrivener, somebody who is employed to write out proclamations and hang them up in public places like St. Paul's Cathedral, which was as much a town notice board as it was a church in Shakespeare's time. So here is the Scrivener. In many, um, in fact, I think probably in most editions, you will say he enters with a paper in his hand. I think he might have two papers in his hand. So he comes in. Here is the indictment of the good Lord Hastings, which in a set hand fairly is engrossed, that it may be today redder in Paul's. And mark how well the sequel hangs together. Eleven hours I have spent to write it over. For yesternight, by Catesby, was it sent me. The precedent was full as long a doing. So that's 11 hours and 11 hours, 22 hours. One to say that there's an indictment, one to say what the result of that indictment is. It's a long time. And yet, within these five hours, Hastings lived, untainted, unexamined, free, at liberty. Here's a good world, world the while. Ah. Uh, okay, right, okay, fine. Uh, something happened, but I think I can, I uh, hope you can still see me. Here's a good world the while. Who is so gross that cannot see this palpable design, device? Yet who's so bold but says he sees it not? Now, this is the action of an ordinary, middling, sort of mean sort of person, a person who writes well, like John Davis, the, who wrote the poem earlier. But 
the, the tyranny that is emerging in his time needs people like him to, to function. And yet he dare not say it is a tyranny. Who's so bold but says he sees it not? I think that's a lesson to us all. Which one of us could say we would be bold enough to say what needs to be said? Were we in his situation? I find this an absolutely chilling speech and one of the most important speeches in the play. Now, that is not working. Uh, I've lost my, whoops. Okay, maybe it is working. Okay, I hope you can see me <laughs> and you can see my screen. Right, I'm gonna move on. So here's another getting ready for a performance. Now, um, the Committee for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts was set up in 1941 because they were the, the British government was concerned that the German government was actually spending so much money on the arts. So they put a little bit of money into supporting music and drama. And the old Vic Theatre Company under Lillian Baylis left its home on the south bank of the Thames because that was actually being used as um, a, a kind of a shelter for people who'd been bombed out of their, their homes. And they were uh, relocated to the north of England and then also went on various tours of the north of England and the Midlands and also of Wales. I think this is a remarkable picture. It shows the uh, poverty of the general population in this country in the, in the 1940s because this is actually a feeding station. It's a local um, hall in the middle of a large town in Wales. Um, and, and these are poor people who've possibly um, been relocated from London or other big cities uh, to escape the bombing, but they're, they're in need of, of food and sustenance. But behind them, the Old Vic Theatre Company is setting up for the performance that night. Um, they were doing it on a shoestring, and yet uh, they had tremendous success. People, there are some pictures of people roaring with laughter at a performance of Merry Wives of Windsor, um, to a packed house of, of, um, of just ordinary, ordinary people. Uh, and this Committee for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts was actually the forerunner of the Arts Council in England. But we've always been a bit iffy in this country about supporting our national culture. Um, I noticed that uh, Boris Johnson, uh, perhaps not so esteemed Prime Minister at the moment, since he's in the middle of a, a um, sleaze scandal, um, uh, tweeted today about happy birthday to Shakespeare, raise a glass to him in our pub gardens. Um, but he has cut back on education and music and the arts education in schools. Um, so I found that a rather hollow tweet. Okay, so we have a problem about how you turn the, the population of the Globe Theatre, 3,000 people. How do you turn these individuals into an audience? Now, Rousseau was talking about the, the, the fact that the individual needed to alienate themselves into a society in order to, uh, to uh, enable uh, every individual to flourish in a community. But you've got this social contract going on every time you walk into a theatre. You don't have to walk into that theatre. The, the actors clearly want you to because they won't survive without an audience. But how do you turn 3,000 individuals into an audience? So this is the opening of, of um, Hamlet. Now, this is a very interesting opening. Bernardo starts. And it's important to notice that it's Francisco who is the sentry. And it's Bernardo who's the relieving sentry. And yet it is not Francisco who challenges Bernardo, but the other way round. Bernardo, who's there? Nay, answer me, stand and unfold yourself. Long live the king. Bernardo, he, you come most carefully upon your hour. That is now struck twelve. Get thee to bed, Francisco. For this relief, much thanks. It is bitter cold and I am sick at heart. Have you had quiet, God? Not a mouse stirring. Well, good night. 
If you do meet Horatio and Marcellus, the rivals of my watch, bid them make haste. I think I hear them. Stand ho, who's there? Now, there are a number of things to notice about this opening. First of all, the number of questions. I count one, two, how many? Three, four, at least four questions in the space of about 10 lines. That's a lot of questions. To be or not to be, that is the question. Questioning is part of what this play is about. Hamlet spends his, his entire, the entire play questioning what he sees, questioning whether he can take action legitimately, questioning what sort of action he can take. Interesting that when the Nazis adopted Hamlet um, as a, a, a play that they should be performing and recategorized Hamlet himself as a heroic Dane, they were trying to get away from this sense of questioning. But you can't unless you rewrite the play because the play is full of questions. That's one of its dramaturgical features. It's the way that Shakespeare writes the play because of course, he's got a fantastic thing to get over in the next 20 minutes, which is a ghost that walks on, on stage large as life because it's portrayed by an actual person. Not, it's not a figment of anybody's um, imagination. It is a ghost. It's played by a flesh and blood uh, um, actor, not a CGI. And he's got to get across to the audience that that is a probable thing to be witnessing. And we can also see from the urgency of Bernardo questioning Francisco first and not the other way around, that Bernardo is expecting to see something. And he's wondering whether Franciscus, Francisco has, has seen it too. Have you had quiet guard? Not a mouse stirring. So Francisco has not seen the ghost. Well, good night. Go away, go to your nice warm bed. We've got, we've got a ghost to meet. But he doesn't want to tell Francisco that. You've got a tremendous sense of anticipation, excitement, questioning. And again, these are minor characters. You're never going to see Francisco again. You're going to see Bernardo a couple of times at most again. He's, he's important in the first scene and um, a later scene, but that's it. Uh, and we don't see Hamlet himself until quite a long way into the play. So it's the way in which Shakespeare turns this well-known story. It's, it's, it's when he, he adopted it, it was a 400 year old story. He found it in an old book, a chrono, chrono, chronology of, um, of Denmark. But it's the way he tells the story that we have to take notice of. Uh, and we can get excitement ourselves from reading it. So much easier to actually hear it well performed than to read it yourself. But try, try reading it yourselves out loud if possible. Okay, so we've had, um, I've already told you, we've got um, the British Prime Minister today celebrating Britishness, uh, um, Englishness in particular, St George's Day and Shakespeare's birthday. And this is a, a, a quotation from Richard II, which is frequently trotted out when everybody, when anybody ever wants to prove that Shakespeare is the well and truly the great British playwright. This royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. Of course, everybody wants to come and live in England, don't they? This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, this nurse, this teeming womb of royal kings, feared by their breed and famous by their birth, renowned for their deeds as far from home as for Christian service and true chivalry, as is the sepulchre in stubborn jury, of the world's ransom, blessed Mary's son, this land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, dear for her reputation through the world is now leased out. I die pronouncing it. 
like to a tenement or pelting farm. England bound in with a triumphant sea whose rocky shore beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune is now bound in with shame, with inky blots and rotten parchment bonds that England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. Now, I frequently trotted out this speech as being what Shakespeare thought about England and what the English ought to think about England. Um, never mind that it's a little bit extreme. Well, of course, John of Gaunt, who's speaking it, is dying. He's wanting to tell the truth to his king, Richard, who he thinks um, has betrayed the country in his behaviour has turned it into a pelting farm, a tenement, um, you know, a miserable, muddy place. Um, and uh, who has a, guilty of a, a dereliction of duty because England's destiny, its, its, its natural identity, is of the triumphant sea, the rocky shore, the entire unconquered island that it is. Well, the same sentiments can be found in a play that Shakespeare wrote probably about 20 years later, at the end of his career anyway, Cymbeline, a play that I became increasingly fond of um, as I was involved in um, acting as dramaturg for production in the States. Now, this is the wicked queen in Cymbeline. The Queen, um, who is prepared to practice vivisection on, on um, innocent animals so that she can devise a poison. Possibly she's poisoning her husband, King Zimbeline. Certainly she wants to get rid of uh, his daughter, Imogen, because his daughter, if she, unless his daughter can be persuaded to marry her son, Cloton, or Clotum, perhaps, um, an, an ignorant um, aggressive and very nasty piece of work. Unless that marriage can go ahead, um, her son won't become king. Um, Imogen will become queen and marry somebody else who will become king. So she's um, wanting to urge her husband and the British to, to make war against the Romans and um, is uh, making exactly the same claim to Englishness as John of Gaunt has done earlier, but in slightly different language, but only, it's, it's, it's only driven up a notch, I think. And yet critics have often been completely bemused as to why the wicked queen should make the one claim to um, patriotism in this play. Remember, sir, my liege, the kings, your ancestors, together with the natural bravery of your isle, which stands as Neptune's park, ribbed and paled in with rocks, unscalable and roaring waters, with sands that will not bear your enemy's boats, but suck them up to the topmast. Now the Goodwin sands off the south coast of England are indeed notorious for being quicksands, but of course they wouldn't just suck up the enemy's boats, they would suck up any boat that happens to go aground on them um, uh, or gets to, uh, too close to land there. So it's it's hubris on her part to say it's only the, the enemy's boats that are going to be sucked up. A kind of conquest Caesar made here. So he was successful for a bit, yes. Um, but he made not hear his brag of came and saw and overcame. With shame, that first that ever touched him, he was carried from off our coast, twice beaten, and his shipping, poor, ignorant baubles, upon our terrible seas, like eggshells moved upon their surges, cracked as easily against our rocks. For joy whereof the famed Cassibelan, who was once at point of oh, gigolo fortune to master Caesar's sword, made Ludstown with rejoicing fires bright and Britons strut with courage. Um, it's a ridiculous speech. It's patently boastful. It's patently untrue. 
Um, it's only, but it is, as I say, only just that little bit more extreme than John of Gaunt's speech in Richard II. Imogen has her own line. When she's banished and she thinks her husband has tried to murder her and uh, she thinks that um, her whole life has come to an end, she decides, just like Coriolanus has done in an earlier play, to go somewhere else. Coriolanus said, there is a world elsewhere. And Imogen says something very similar. She says that England is, as in a great pool, a swan's nest. Now, a swan's nest, if you've ever seen a swan's nest on an English riverbank, it's a pile of not particularly well put together sticks and a lot of mud. So to describe the country, the heroine of this play describes England as a rather muddy pile of sticks on the edge of Europe. And my fear is that as <laughs> Boris Johnson managed to bring us out of Europe, that is what we will become to a muddy pile of twigs on the edge of Europe. I hope I'm not correct in that supposition, but there is in Shakespeare evidence um, for all sorts of different views of the world. Uh, and there is possibility of reinterpreting Shakespeare in all sorts of different ways. All I would say is that it's really important to play the play with as much attention to the way it's written as possible. That you don't try to say, well, that bit's too difficult and I think I'll cut it, or that bit's improper and I think I'll cut it because I want to make sure that I can present a heroic Shakespeare for, of some kind. We've got to see this wonderful, imaginative work, which is a direct descendant of that bone flute 40,000 years ago. We've got to see his work as an expression of what it means to be human and to try and be human in the most profound and collaborative and international transnational, let's forget about nations, let's just think about what it is to be human. Thank you very much indeed. So can I get back to you? Yes, I'm back. I'm in the show. Everybody can hear and see me, I hope. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Yes, ma'am. So uh, thank you, Professor Ross, for giving us a beautiful insight on Shakespeare that was really different and interesting, though. So uh, we take a couple of questions from the chat. Professor Ross, can we go ahead with question and session? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, thank you. So the first question is from Mr. Vikas, who has asked this question. Why Shakespeare, such a highly regarded playwright, is compared to so many other great ones. Um, do you think you know, is that because you think he shouldn't be compared with other ones, or that he should be compared with other ones? I'm not. I'm not quite sure. Uh, um, well, perhaps I shall answer both questions in that case. Um, I think it's really important that we understand what we mean by being highly regarded. As I said, the the Nazis highly regarded what they claimed to be Wilhelm Shakespeare. Um, but I don't think that was our, I don't think that was the world's William Shakespeare. So it's important that we understand what it is we're regarding. Um, and he's not the only playwright in the world, of course not. There are still people writing wonderful plays, as they should. Um, I think that the better we understand the way Shakespeare writes plays, the better we can continue to write wonderful plays far into the future. And I hope that um, playwriting continues to be a mode of um, uh, expression and exploration and social contract right the way across the world. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you, ma'am. Uh, and the next question from Mr. Ram Kumar. To what extent was Shakespeare regarded with neoliberalism? Uh, 
if you mean the neoliberalism of um, Mrs. Thatcher's government and, and the adoption of a certain type of, of politics and economics, there was an attempt um, by uh, the Tory governments of the what 19... 90s, 80s and 90s, to uh, co-opt Shakespeare into their political argument. Um, I remember a Chancellor of the Exchequer wanting to raise uh, interest rates, um, proclaimed once more into the breach, dear friends, once more, um, which got me so cross that I wrote an, an article for our, one of our leading national newspapers. Um, People have always attempted to adopt Shakespeare and to um, bring him into certain political folds. Uh, you can only do that, in my view, if you extract quotations out of context. Uh, it's really important, as I try to demonstrate today, uh, that uh, you read the whole play. Uh, the, the, it, there's a famous phrase, isn't there? Um, it's like having Hamlet without the prince. It's like having the play without the prince. Well, I would say, actually, that you can't have Hamlet the character without the play. That our understanding of what it means to be Hamlet depends on that first scene with Mar Marcello and Bernardo and Francesco. Our understanding of what it means to be Richard III depends on, it absolutely crucially depends, actually, on what the Scrivener says. Um, so that it's uh, it's the view from the bottom that interests me uh, and i think despite all evidence to the contrary and a lot of criticism to the contrary there are important minor characters in shakespeare's plays who give very profound um viewpoints on the main story and the main uh, action and that if you try to strip them out and pretend they don't matter then you are in danger of rewriting the play. You can rewrite a text by cutting it just as much as you can by adding in extra bits of text. In fact, you can probably rewrite it more effectively if you cut it because um, you just remove from public view all the things that would contribute to a paradox. And it is the paradox that I think we need to pay attention to when discussing Shakespeare. Paradox is that he absolutely drives into his work the, the differences of opinion, the conflicts um, that he wants us as an audience to become engaged with. So I don't think he's a neo, I don't think Shakespeare's a neoliberal. Um, uh, and I think anybody who tries to make him out to be uh, can only do so by cutting him and extracting out of context. Thank you, ma'am. So here are a few more interesting questions coming up. Why is Shakespeare important to Indian readers? Well, that's an interesting. I mean, is he important to Indian leaders? Is, is that is that is that the question? Indian leaders. Is that Why right? is it important to the Indian readers? In what context? That's the question. Oh, readers, readers. Sorry, sorry. Readers. Um, because. As I have tried to explain, um, the, I would I would urge you to read it out aloud, um, ha knowing the story in advance. I would urge you to think about the the language, not as language difficulty, but as images. Think about why has he why has he brought in this particular image of the swan's nest? Go and Google it. What does a swan's nest look like? Then wonder yourself as to what it might mean to to view um, England in that way, uh, I think it. I think the the language as poetry is important to all of us because it is capable of being reinterpreted um, in different cultures. I mean, I've seen some um, wonderful reports and and images of of um, Indian Romeo and Juliet, for example, of South Korean. Uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, um, of a, a of a Chinese Macbeth, uh, Japanese adaptations, a very very famous um, uh, film ad adaptation, of course, by Kurosawa. I think his that he's inspired people across the world to make great art, and I think it's important that we concentrate on the great art that uh, uh, that um, 
that results from reading it. But you, you've got to read it first, uh, I, I think, and, and uh, try and embody it yourself. This, this is language which is meant to be performed. He, it's, it's often said that there are no stage directions in Shakespeare. That is absolutely not true. Every half line tends to be a stage direction because the choice of words makes it more difficult or less difficult to say. Uh, it introduces an image. It means that you've got to move or you've got to kneel or you've got to raise your hand or something. Otherwise, what you're saying does not make sense. Every line is a stage direction. Um, and it's the, the difficulty in reading Shakespeare is actually translating it into, into the moving image in your head. That's why it's often much, much easier to listen to it or to watch it, um, preferably watch it, um, than, than to read it. But do both. Um, and then go and write your own, I would suggest. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your uh, answers, wonderful answers, though. So, uh, like I mentioned, you really took us to another world of Shakespeare and uh, you gave us a new insight on Shakespearean place, especially. So, thank you very much, ma'am, uh, for the wonderful session indeed and a lot of comments in the chat box as well. It was informative, interesting, enlightening, all that. So, uh, I would like to thank you, Professor Ross King, who is a Professor Emeritus from University of Southampton. Thank you, ma'am, for sparing your valuable time with us. And uh, at this juncture, I would extend my warm sense of gratitude to the management uh, who is constantly motivating us. And I, I place on record my sincere thanks to our principal, Dr. Vijila Kennedy, who's constantly motivating us and guiding us to take up such wonderful ventures. And uh, I would like to thank Dr. Radhika, Associate Professor of School of English, for taking such an arduous task uh, because uh, she took uh, initiative to conduct such an event to commemorate Shakespeare, the Bard yeah. of Avon. And okay. uh, I would like to thank Dr. Manjula Bashani, the department lead and the faculty team of School of English here. Uh, my thanks to the School of Visual Communication for their uh, technical support. All the students also who have been giving us background support for conducting this webinar in a smooth manner. And uh, on behalf of School of English of Kumaraguru College of Liberal Arts and Science, we thank all the participants, all the ladies and gentlemen out here uh, who joined us on all the three days. So today we are on the third day of this international virtual talk series. Thank you all for joining us. Hope it was an enlightening session and journey with class as well. So uh, I would also like to thank all of you here and we would like to meet you all in, uh, in future sessions like this. Um, so another announcement regarding e-certificates. Participants, you will be getting your e-certificates within a week's time. And uh, the participants who have attended all the three sessions will be receiving the e-certificates. And uh, of course, today is some people claim it, it is World Book Day. Some people claim it, it is World Language Day. So Shakespeare rightly said, it's not in the stars to hold our destiny but it is in ourselves. So mm. let's see that we make the best of our future. We cherish our life every moment. So let's commemorate the Bard of Avon on this great day and happy to have such eminent persons like Professor Ross in commemorating Shakespeare. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you all. Well, thank you all too. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and, and to meet you uh, even virtually. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.